there's a dog that's not barking, if you will, and that's the media has not said, to my knowledge, almost anything about what's happening in Venezuela. Uh, they started by using the registry of guns to confiscate under the Chavez regime, and now even the press has been completely hammered by the Maduro government. Uh, the situation is becoming very dire in that country, and uh, our, met, our press is not saying a word about what is going on in Venezuela. So just one more example of what they think is news and you know, what is not news, and evidently a, a major producer of oil, uh, which is kind of important for the world economy, and it's going down the toilet, and our press just hasn't bothered to mention it at all. I wanted to uh, mention that uh, one of the favorite topics, and, and where we've had trouble even among conservatives is the subject of background checks. Well, surely you don't want to have guns sold to the wrong hands, would be the major argument there. Um, I want to make sure, by the way, that, that one of the ways to counter that is, I want to make sure that the right hands have guns. And most gun control is oriented to keeping guns from ever getting sold. Our emphasis needs to be we want more of the right people to be encouraged to have guns because that's what makes a society safe. And as I pointed out yesterday, the safer places in our country are precisely the places where people can have guns and carry guns. Uh, that uh, is a rather inconvenient fact for uh, those who are on the other side. But they want to uh, make the argument that somehow the background check is is really going to make a difference. Well, in the last year that I'm aware of the data, there were some 20 million background checks done. That's a lot of guns being purchased, not, and that doesn't even include, of course, those that are being sold in many states legally between individuals without any paperwork whatsoever. Uh, that's an obvious target for the, uh, for the socialists who want to go after that zone of freedom that's still left. The, um, the background check, uh, those 20 million, some 40, 43 maybe, prosecutions resulted, and not all of those were convictions. That is an incredibly low percentage. In other words, the background check is absolutely useless as a crime control uh, procedure. But what it does do, and I think why it's been so tenacious, tenacious, tenaciously advocated by uh, our opponents, is that it gives the government an opportunity to have a copy, to have a record of everybody who's buying a gun at a store, which is like 20 million people. And the law says that they can't do that. Well, do we really think the government keeps the law? <laughs> uh, you've no doubt heard about the uh, head of the IRS uh, under the Obama administration. She was using her position as the head of the IRS to clobber conservative organizations. She was completely violating the law and she's yet to be brought to justice, even under a new administration. Now admittedly they have a lot of things to take care of, so uh, I'm not, I'm reserving judgment on that one. but. The fact is, Lois Lerner broke the law on a daily basis, and it was a very flagrant abuse of power that the federal government shouldn't have been exercising uh, control in that area at all, and that's, of course, the problem. Once they have, quote-unquote, authority in an area, they have a pattern of abusing it. And so I think one of our default assumptions should be get the government out of these various areas. The Constitution gives them very, very, very few areas where they've been told to work. So I think we need to keep them uh, to that. One of the things that I've noticed as I debate these folks on the other side is that they, their conclusions, their thinking 
is driven by feelings. Mm -hmm. And conservatives tend to, to the extent that we're successful in doing what we say we're doing, we, we try to use linear logic. And if facts don't fit, then we're willing to make an adjustment assuming that those <coughs> new facts are valid. Uh, we, we understand we're finite, but we certainly want to have reality-based thinking. And the left wants to have things based on feeling regardless of the outcome. For them, an intention is the only thing they'll ever be held uh, to account for. Did you mean well? Um, so the, the, uh, the idea that, um, for instance, all of the mass murders that have occurred in our country since 1950 all but four have taken place in gun-free zones. A school building that said no guns, or a church, or some mall perhaps. And that has been the pattern for over 50 years. And we still stay stuck on it. And when I point that out to people in debate, say, yeah, but I just don't feel safe knowing that other people might be walking around carrying a gun. Well, yeah, but it's actually, those are the places that are the safest in our country. I know, but I just don't feel safe. And so you've got facts and linear logic that you've arrayed and the obstacle, and I can't tell you that I have a magic wand and I understand how to defeat that kind of thinking, but you have to recognize that it's based on feeling. And at least we can expose it in debate so that those who are watching get a chance to see that these are real differences. So uh, that's something that I, I've taken away from my involvement in the public debate. Another area of legislative assault against the Second Amendment has been in the area of liability. Uh, there's been an effort to make the use of guns uh, prohibitively expensive, sometimes uh, a direct tax. Our President uh, Obama was endeavoring to make gunsmiths uh, into manufacturers and make them pay huge fees which would have put most gunsmiths out of business. Um, I'm jumping ahead to the biblical analysis of this issue, but uh, one of the uh, points of attack of, of tyrants that we see even in, in the scripture, when the Jews were subjected to foreign rule, uh, when they were in rebellion against God, and God allowed uh, the Philistines usually to take them over, um, one of the descriptions of those times in the book of Judges is, and there were no blacksmiths in the land. Today we would probably uh, similarly report there were no gunsmiths in the land. Uh, if you can't fix your gun, the gun's useless. It's a five pound paperweight perhaps, they <laughs> can throw it, but that's, that's about it. And, and so the, the idea of making guns somehow the ownership of them a, a legal liability and they've gone after companies that make guns when a crook uses the gun. The company didn't do anything illegal, but the effort was to shut down uh, similar to the, the ploy that Obama was making against gunsmiths is to go after the company and make them shoulder such a burden for, say, insurance uh, that they can't get insurance and thus they won't be able to operate because they would lose everything if they ever got hit with one of these lawsuits that the gun that you made was used in that murder. Well, yeah, but I was not in the country at the time. I had nothing to do with it. That's okay. It, it was something that you made and it's your fault. Not that the gun that was made blew up in somebody's hands. Now, that would be a legitimate liability issue. That would be when they should be taken to court and have to pay damages to make whole the person that was harmed by what they actually were responsible for having made happen. But, um, and even there you'd have to show that the product was being properly used and it still malfunctioned and it still caused damage. Because obviously if it had not been properly maintained, then all bets are off and liability probably shifts right back uh, to the user. 
So those are some of the, uh, the issues that uh, I wanted to hit that we have to deal with. And probably we're going to have to continue dealing with, I would suspect the background check is one of the uh, major areas of concern, uh, whether it at, be at the state level or at the federal level. There seems to be a, an inability for even conservatives to realize how useless the background check is for its stated purpose as a crime control measure and how useful it is to governments that want to know where all the guns are. Uh, it is such an old, it's like Linus continues to fall for Lucy's lie. She'll hold the football this time. I promise I won't misuse the list of names that are being made of gun owners. You're thinking of Charlie Brown. Uh, sorry, Charlie Brown, thank you. Uh, we get a kick out of that. And so, the, the, at the end of the day, we, uh, uh, we just keep coming back to the same problem and hopefully uh, we're not going to fall for it. Uh, it's going to be something that we see what they're trying uh, and the, that the background check is a, um, it's a lie. Uh, it's a, it doesn't work for its stated purposes and it is being used, has been used uh, for government abuse of power and control of populations. Chavez didn't uh, ever allege that guns were the problem. Well, he alleged that guns were the problem, but when he collected all the guns, then problems really got started in Venezuela. And that's what's happened in country after country after country around the world. Uh, so we should be alert uh, to these problems. And I think the, uh, the background check is the one that even with the Republicans and in control of most of our governments at the moment, uh, this is an area most likely to be one of vulnerability uh, in the days ahead, even under these political conditions. So uh, keep in mind that it is not a crime-fighting tool, but it is a great tyranny-building tool. Uh, so, so much for the, the background <coughs> check. One of the th things that uh, Many years ago, I thought as a, as a leader in my church, an elder elected by the congregation, I'd really better be able to show people that this controversial area that I'm working in uh, is not something that's counter to Scripture. And so quite some time ago, we put together something which uh, the full text of it you can find on our website at gunowners.org. What does the Bible say about gun control? The first thing as we started <clears throat> dealing with this issue from that point of view, from what does the scripture say, is that when you look at the first murder, and you go back to the first four, four chapters or so of Genesis, and you read the account of, of that first murder, you read about the people involved, and you read about what God did in response to it, and there's one thing that you never read about in the scripture, in the account of that first crime, that first murder. It wasn't the first crime, it was the first murder. We don't know what instrument was used to commit the murder. We don't know if it was a rock, if it was a board, if it was a horseshoe, uh, if it was the jawbone of a donkey. We just don't know. Apparently, the instrument used in crime is not of great interest to God. His concern immediately before, and he warned Cain that uh, you're heading for trouble, bud. Uh, just look at your face. You're heading for, for deep trouble. So the warning was to Cain and the, basically the state of his heart. And after the murder, uh, God didn't say, let's round up all the rocks or whatever it might have been, uh, but he dealt with Cain. And Cain was the one that had to be separated from the rest of humanity because he was so lawless and so dangerous. And so I think that uh, uh, is probably the major takeaway for any discussion that we would ever have about what do we do with a crime problem? What do we do with 
the crime in the center cities. Well, uh, I mentioned yesterday that I had a debate just before I came up here uh, on a center city Milwaukee radio station, and the there were two fellows that were on the other side, uh, the radio talk show host, and he brought in a a, um, a guy that he said was a veteran about my age that he said had been in Vietnam. I didn't know anything about the guy, so I just that was not where I chose to to take them on. But and there are people that have been in the military who are quite opposed to mere citizens having guns. That's not a normal view. That's not a generally shared view of people in the military. But they're there, and it's possible this uh, left-wing talk show host found one. Uh, but they were. They were convinced that uh, the problem in Chicago was the availability of guns. And I said, well, that's interesting because they've got all these laws against guns in Chicago, and they'd have a complete ban if it weren't for uh, some court rulings. So what do you do about that? Um, the, uh, obviously, the criminals are getting guns, and the good guys are not. And so all you've done is to help the bad guys. Aren't you proud of yourself? And um, they don't want to accept responsibility. Right. Uh, they want to go after... Somehow it's the, it's the gun that made me do it, do it. It's the car that made me speed. It's the pencil that made me misspell. <laughs> really. Uh, we even have a t-shirt that kind of makes fun of that uh, series of misstatements uh, because it's pretty easy to make fun of, really, if you take a look at what they're actually saying. Um, there are a number of Christians, and I've had to deal with some of them, that think that Christianity, that the Bible, teaches pacifism. And one of their chief uh, notions is, well, doesn't the Bible say that you're supposed to turn the other cheek? And indeed, Matthew does talk about turning the other cheek. If you get slapped on one, turn the other cheek. Uh, with the implication being so that that side can be slapped as well. The, the reference in, in that text in Matthew is to an insult. Uh, those of you who might have ever been in the South or lived in the South uh, might be a little bit more familiar with this code of honor that some cultures have. And the way you would start a duel uh, in the South uh, particularly, but uh, sometimes in, anywhere in colonial America, would be to have somebody for you or you yourself go up and slap the guy. And then supposedly he would respond by accepting the challenge to a duel. And what you're looking at in that situation is that two individuals are saying that the justice system that God has spoken about in the, in the scriptures isn't needed for them. And that they're going to resolve the matter on their own. Because the slap on the face does not involve self-defense. The slap on the face is an insult. And the way to deal with an insult is probably to make fun of the person insulting. It's to ignore them. Uh, but it's certainly not to pull out your gun and shoot. That's uh, uh, not a proportionate response, shall we say. And there's no justification for that uh, in Scripture uh, because using lethal violence is strictly limited to the defense of life. And there it's prescribed in Scripture. The study that we've done, I came to the conclusion that it's pretty close to a mandate in Scripture that you protect life. That that's the, uh, a, a very important concept that's throughout the Scripture, Old and New Testament alike. And so the, the idea that you... Uh, ignore, uh, you can ignore a slap on the face, you can ignore somebody saying stupid things about you or your mother or whatever, but where you need to get engaged is where they're actually threatening to steal somebody's livelihood, they're threatening to take their lives. That's where ideally the state can be involved if there's time to be involved, but if there's not, then you do what you can to defend life on your own. And that's why the carrying of firearms is so important because 
it's one of the chief means that we have available of fairly conveniently having a, a rather effective means of defending life. And that's a core biblical concept. So a government that says you can't have a gun, and I think we're in a jurisdiction that virtually says you can't carry a gun concealed, probably or openly. Um, the laws are pretty severe. Uh, they're getting better in New Hampshire, uh, but next door in Massachusetts, it's pretty severe. And uh, I don't think that is biblical because they're saying that the good guy should just uh, accept whatever the bad guy dishes out, even if it's lethal. And that is incredible that the government, all of a sudden, as Romans says, is to be a terror to evildoers and a comfort to the righteous. And yet the government in Massachusetts, in those ways, has become a comfort to the evildoers and has actually become a terror to the righteous. We'll put you in jail, bud, if you have a gun to defend yourself. Even though you, you don't do anything wrong with it, you're not robbing a bank, uh, you're not shooting stupidly in a neighborhood or anything like that, you're just carrying it for self-defense, they want to make that a crime. They have made that a crime. That is a very serious violation of biblical poor notion of what is the role of government. And uh, happily, we're actually making progress in pushing that idea back. We now have a dozen or more states where you don't need the government's permission at all to carry a firearm, concealed or otherwise. I was not applauded for that on the talk show yesterday. <laughs> uh, they don't like the idea, and it's, it's, in, it's incredible. They actually don't refute, they just kind of ignore the idea that their policies actually do favor the bad guys. Uh, and they are so afraid of the average person uh, that uh, they don't want to uh, uh, allow, if they can have it, they don't want to allow the availability of effective self-defense. Um, because a lot of people get hurt very seriously, if not killed, because of these ideas that these people have. And so hopefully we're going to be able to push them back in more than a dozen states where we have already and continue pushing. The, um, the idea is somehow there's a conf confusion, and I'd like to deal with it, in the, where the scripture tells us that you've heard it said that uh, in dealing with a challenge you the principle for responding is an eye for an eye. Well, one of the things that I notice when I look through the scripture on this is that you've heard it said was a reference to what usually the Pharisees were saying. In other words, uh, to put it a little bit more explicitly, you've heard it said falsely. Because when scripture says it is usually put in terms of it is written. Yeah, right. But you've heard it said means uh, uh, the talking head on uh, CNN said, or something like that. Uh, so that was what they were dealing with, with the eye for an eye. The eye for an eye is a principle of, of justice that is to be used by the government in meeting out proper punishment for crimes that are committed. So if you steal money, then you're going to have to repay money. In fact, the Bible even provides multiples are going to have to be repaid, uh, depending on the nature of the crime exactly. Uh, but you, you not only have to repay the amount of money that was stolen or the amount of damage that was caused, but to make it whole and then some, maybe twice or even some occasions five times over. Uh, that's kind of a disincentive for being a criminal, I would think. Because if you get caught, it's really going to cost you. And I think that was part of the idea. But the main idea of biblical justice is to restore the victim. And the victim really doesn't get paid much attention in our system. And we've got very few jurisdictions where there's any concept of restitution by the criminal. Restitution sometimes 
is a fine that's paid to the government. The government wasn't almost ever the victim. And yet the government is claiming the right to restitution be paid to it. Uh, we've come a long way from where these principles actually made America such a strong and vibrant country. Um, let's see, what, uh, well, the time is flying. Um, sometimes we're told that, well, you know, we're told to trust God. Uh, uh, there's a passage that sometimes gets cited. Uh, but if anyone uh, were, were to trust God for, for the outcome, but it, what it, I think the confusion has been that um, we are to do what we can to make sure that good things, righteous things, happen. Uh, then if we don't see things working out, the best way possible, well, uh, God is sovereign, but uh, the, the main thing is that we do what we can, and we are to be able, and hopefully willing, to defend ourselves and our families. Uh, this is not, that's not the primary function of the government. Obviously, if there's a cop standing right next to you, and somebody comes up and tries to assault you, then sure, the government, uh, hopefully, if it's not Berkeley, will step in and make an arrest. In Berkeley, they are so perverted that the cops actually stood back. Same thing in Baltimore. The cops were, stole, were told to pull back uh, and to favor the criminals. Uh, you really don't want to reside in an area, in an area like that. Um, the, um, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And that's something that Paul wrote to Timothy. Now, a lot of times I believe that provide for his household is viewed as maybe a shelter and food. Good, that's, I think that is provision. But then is this shelter and food to be uh, left in an area with no locks on the door? Uh, I think most people that are even arguing against armed citizenry would actually say, well, no, you don't have locks on the door. Well, then you're saying that evil people may try to do something. So then why do you draw the line at locks on the door? But if the lock is defeated, you're going to be helpless? And that doesn't make sense. And of course, biblically, it's counter to what we're being taught in Scripture. Um, We even have court cases that have happily found in the right, concluded rightly, that the government is not responsible for our individual safety. Uh, there may be times when a police officer could be completely liable uh, because he was just standing around watching while you had the tar beat out of but. That's not a normal occurrence. That, that's, that's only Berkeley, California, or, or Baltimore. Most times, uh, there's just not that kind, kind of liability, and the state does not owe you to come at your beck and call. Uh, they, they will if they can, uh, but that's not what the police are there for. And the courts, I think rightly, have consistently ruled over the years that the government is not responsible for providing individual safety. It's, it's responsible for bringing the bad guys before the bar of justice and meeting out the, just, the justice that is appropriate. And that means you and I, even in the eyes of the law, are left to defend ourselves. And in most jurisdictions of our country still, happily, uh, that's a recognized principle. And in most jurisdictions, even the use of a firearm uh, is accepted in a situation where you have to defend yourself. Uh, it's possible that uh, people use guns where they're not supposed to have them, and normally the government just says, okay, never mind. Uh, 
a case that uh, comes to my mind was a fellow in a mall in Oregon, and the mall under state law was permitted to say no guns. Well, this chap uh, that I'm thinking of had uh, either been unaware of the posting no guns or very likely had disregarded it, but he was there with his otherwise legally concealed carry handgun. And he saw a guy start to shoot, uh, and obviously with the purpose of committing murder uh, against a number of people, I think it was into a store. And he produced his, the good guy produced his gun and stopped what very likely could have been a mass murder. There never was any prosecution of him, even though he had his gun illegally in that place. Gun was legal, soon, you know, as soon as he left the mall, he was legal with it. But once he went in, he was actually violating the quirk of that state law. And happily for a lot of people that day, he was uh, not legally carrying. But it was a good guy carrying, and it was a stupid law that could have ended up with a lot of people getting killed. Uh, I'm not making any recommendations, but I do think that's food for thought. Um, oh yeah, um, when, when Christ was in the garden and the illegal arrest was about to take place and the temple guards were coming on Christ and the disciples around him, Peter, as you may recall, drew his sword and actually used it against one of the guards and Christ restored the guard and told Peter, put your sword back uh, in its sheath. Um, don't you know that those who live by the sword die by the sword? Well, the reference obviously was to those who live lawlessly. If you live by the sword, then you're not living by the law. Uh, you're not relying on the police for the normal course of carrying out justice. Um, and Christ had never said anything to Peter while they, in fact, he had actually uh, complimented him uh, in the upper room during the Last Supper when he talked about, if you don't have a sword, you ought to buy one. And Peter had produced one and Christ had said, good. And then, what, two, three hours later, uh, he's telling Peter to put his sword back and those who live by the sword die by the sword. Obviously, he if he were of the opinion that people shouldn't have the means of self-defense, he would have told Peter that in the upper room. What, uh, what I think is, is the message of Scripture, when Christ was in that situation, he told Peter to put back the sword. He said, don't you realize I have to drink the cup my Father has given me? That if he, were, if he wanted to, he could send a legion of angels uh, to bring me out of the situation. And so, by saying that, he was saying, Peter, you still don't understand why I've come to earth. You still don't understand that the Son of God has to die for the sins of men so that uh, many can be saved and spared the rigors of hell. Uh, that, uh, I think, was the clear message that Christ was telling Peter that he hadn't really seen that main reason for Christ having come. And so, if it were possible, Peter would have prevented the salvation of men, uh, those who would believe in Christ, uh, because he would have prevented the crucifixion, without which there can be no salvation through Jesus Christ. So, uh, it was a very serious situation that Peter was uh, involved in, and it was only later, obviously, he clearly understood it later, but at the time, this was not something that he, he could fathom. And he was willing, he was ready to fight, although when the time came and he could have fight, he did flee uh, with the others. Uh, and to his credit, he records that in Scripture, making the point that there's a time and a place uh, for the use of violence. And he had not understood that principle that, that well. There's a, largely, this subject, I think, is something that we can focus on 
in terms of individual responsibilities and freedom. Uh, but it's also, I think, it, it has a national uh, collective element to it. When Israel kept turning away from God, God would allow them to be overrun by the Philistines and subjected to terrible oppression. But, and it was clear that these things were being allowed to happen because they had first turned away from God, and so he removed his hand of protection from the land of Israel. They, uh, in fact, in the book of Judges, it, it says, they chose new gods. And then there, there was war in the gates. Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. So interesting that disarmament is actually a national curse. Look at Venezuela to go back to that poor country. They're disarmed, and are they ever suffering? What a curse uh, they have put on themselves. Because a lot of the people that are being disarmed are the ones that I'm sure had voted for Chavez initially. Because as in most dictatorships, you have one man, one vote, once. And that was about 17 or 18 years ago, and they haven't had a, a real election since then. When the elections have been held, the, the government always had its thumb on the scale on the outcome. So we, we need to consider that uh, these, these issues will affect not only us, but our whole country. And those that we love, our families, are, are going to be either blessed by the freedom that comes from uh, living in a land that's free or will suffer the kinds of oppressions that we can see just about anywhere in the world where uh, these things are, are happening. Um, I think that's probably enough. There's so many things that we, well, maybe just to close off that last point. When Jehoshaphat was king, he had um, built up the defenses of Israel, but it happened at a time when he had restored Israel to a people of faith. He had led the way to a revival in Israel. Following that, their defenses were, were built up, and when they were a mighty military power, there was peace. The surrounding nations were afraid of them. Uh, Literally, there was a fear of God that had resulted from what Jehoshaphat had done. So there's a clear connection, it seems, in the Scripture, anywhere you look, uh, between freedom and, the, and faithfulness to God and being armed. And if we end up being disarmed, it's not a good thing. And it probably we should be searching ourselves and our fellow men to see where we've gone wrong and how we have departed from being faithful to God and to cry out for a restoration of allegiance to the one true king uh, that ought to be what all of us uh, want to have who all of us want to have rule us. In the little bit of time that's left, hopefully there might be some questions that we can discuss. So, yes, sir. Um, yeah. Please stand up. Please stand up so we can all hear you. Did you notice how Jesus told his disciples to buy a sword, not a spear? A sword was more like a handgun back then, a spear was like an air pad rifle or something like that. You know, that's a, probably a fair point. I'm not sure how far you want to take it, but the, the thing is he did say, buy a personal weapon. Uh, sure. And so today he might have said either to buy um, a handgun or he might have even been saying buy a rifle because the sword was the principal uh, weapon that every soldier would have. And uh, uh, today every soldier would have a rifle. Um, every, every man a rifle, I think, is the, uh, the idea that the Marines inculcate. And in Switzerland, I really like the way they view it. Um, the, a rifle is the emblem of a free man. That's a saying in Switzerland. Uh, at least it used to be. I think hopefully it's st there are still some who who remember that. And also, uh, do you have a suggestion? 
question for someone like me who's not old enough to carry a gun. Besides the knife, is there something I carry for self-defense? Uh, knives are uh, perhaps uh, permissible by the law, but also uh, uh, various kinds of uh, sprays that can at least disable the attacker long enough to give you time to run away. Um, so those are the two things that are probably most practical. And in most places legal, although uh, the uh, uh, pepper spray was illegal for quite some time in Washington, D.C. <laughs> they really were in favor of the criminals. It's just stunning how obvious it was. Pepper spray is illegal in New York? Well, uh, that's sad. And that's actually very dangerous. But uh, it's not surprising because they've done, well, this is the, uh, New York's the state of the uh, SAFE Act, uh, where they illegalized the quintessential militia firearm. So they're basically saying, take the Second Amendment and throw it out the window. That's, that's what they're saying. Just with a little bit of pepper spray, no, but also with the rifles. <coughs> Anybody else? Uh, yeah. Uh, it was a little hard to hear. You may want to stand up so everybody can hear. Because um, I also live in New York, you can find it so, like this is a pharmacy because I do carry it on um, myself at all times. Interesting. And you can probably buy it online. Uh, yeah, but there's a problem with shipping because they often because they won't ship it to you because it's the New York. I see. I see. Well, then you want to have friends out of state. <laughs> okay. All right. That's. Uh, uh, okay, what, you're right. the boss. Okay, yeah, well, we have man, one quick one real quick. Can you, so a lot of these cops, these campers are going to be going back to school in a little while. <coughs> Can you give them a good little tight way of responding when a teacher or a fellow student says the Second Amendment really means a well-regulated militia? Because that's what the liberals always come back with. If it's not the militia, that's what they pick. Well, one way to um, respond to that is who is the militia? Mr. Mr. Crack, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, you may hear it said, certainly in school, by many teachers that the Second Amendment refers to a militia and it's designed to protect a militia having guns. A well regulated, well regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state. And then they kind of forget what comes next the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. But even if we only deal with the first part of the Second Amendment, the question would be, who is the militia? Certainly the founders viewed the militia as every man between the ages typically of 17 and 44. The state laws might vary slightly, but the militia basically was everybody. And if you were called up, which you could be, your town might decide that eh, next Thursday we're going to have a militia muster. You had to be there. You know, you might have been out of town, but if you were not providentially unable to be there, you had to be there, and you could be fined for not showing up to a militia muster. And when you came, you had to have your gun. Now, sometimes they would give you a firearm if they considered you legitimately unable to have your own long arm. But sometimes they would fine you. Maybe they realized you were just shirking. Uh, they were serious. They wanted everybody to have a gun. And our first couple of national militia acts passed by the Congress of the United States stated just that, that the militia would show up with their own guns. Uh, so today, if we were consistent and carried that principle forward, it would say that everyone, since we don't just speak about men, in our time, everyone must have uh, an M16, which is a fully automatic battle rifle that uh, is similar to what the military carries. So that would be the uh, situation today. Well, let's give Mr. Pratt a nice warm hand.